today's lecture, we're going to wrap up chapter six, where we had already started talking about schedules of reinforcement and choice behavior. So last time we finished off our schedules of reinforcement portion of the chapter, and we just dabbled our toes into choice behavior. So that's what we're going to pick up again for today. And so just a quick, quick reminder that when we're talking about choice behavior, especially in terms of learning and behavior in the lab, we're looking at usually concurrent choices. So they have the choice between pecking key A and key B, or they have the choice between pressing lever one and lever two. If we were looking at sort of free choice, as would be seen in the wild, there are so many other possible options that we couldn't really understand what was going on. There's too many extra variables in that system. So when we're looking at choice, we're looking at a very artificial, scaled down version of choice that actually fits in the lab. Just something that's a good idea to keep in mind while we're working through this, because while this does get us at some of the mechanisms and things going on behind choices, it isn't necessarily directly applicable to what we see out in nature. It just gives us a clue as to what might be going on. And so when we're talking about these concurrent choices, we're usually looking at the choice between two different schedules of reinforcement that are being offered. So the example here is that key A is associated with schedule A, which is a variable interval of 60 seconds or so. And then ver uh, schedule B is associated with key B, and that's a fixed ratio of 10. So uh, if they peck key A after about 60 seconds have passed, they should get a food reward. And if they peck key B, every 10 pecks, they should get a food reward. And so we're going to look at the mechanisms that would lead a bird to choose to peck A or B or both, and at what rate are they choosing to peck those. Now at the end of the last lecture, I'm not quite sure that I explained our relative rate of responding versus relative rate of reinforcement the best way possible, so I'm going to go over them again here. It might be very, very similar to what we talked about last time. I just want to make sure I said it correctly and that I'm getting the point across because these are going to be important when we start talking about matching and um, specifically the matching log. So when we're talking about our relative rate of responding, we're looking at the animal's behavior. So that pigeon in the operant box who's picking between key A and key B, the one on the left and the one on the right, we're looking at what are they actually doing? How many times are they pecking on the left versus on the right? So we look at their measured rate of responding on the left um, and then divide it by the total amount of responding that they're doing. So combine both left and right responding to get a ratio of how much they're pecking on the left. And I think I said last time that you can, uh, this is set up right now so that we're looking at it being on the left. We also then, once we know what their rate of responding on the left is, can infer what their rate of responding is on the right because it's a ratio and there's only two options. So if their rate of responding on the left is 20%, then we know that their rate of responding on the right is going to be 80% because they're responding to either the left or the right, so the totals should add up to 100%. Um, we just tend to frame versus one side, and then you can assume what the other side was because we know there's only two keys. All right, so that's our relative rate of responding. That's what the pigeon is actually doing in the box. Then we have our relative rate of reinforcement, and this isn't specifically tied to the behavior that's happening. This is tied to what our schedule of reinforcement is, what the two options are for our two different keys. Now this was the part that I wasn't positive was well explained last time, so I'm going to take my time here and just make sure that we go over it very well, just so that I get it across properly. Alright, so we can have our two keys, our left and our right, and we can have a fixed ratio of, let's say, 10 on this side, and a fixed ratio of 10 on this side as well. And so what that tells us is that for both of the keys, both of the options, if the pigeon packs 10 times, they'll receive a food reward or food reinforcer. 
So if we wanted to look at our relative rate of reinforcement, these two are equal. And so we'd see a relative rate of reinforcement of 0.5 because they're equal. So about 50% of the reinforcement would come from here, 50% from here, theoretically. Um, so they're equivalent in this situation. So what happens if we change it up? And I'm not going to have you calculate this out. Um, this equation actually gets very complicated to calculate out, especially when we start playing between fixed ratios and variable ratios and uh, intervals and like trying to compare between them. So we're just keeping it very uh, theoretical at this point rather than having you calculate it out. But let's consider what happens if we change. So all of a sudden this fixed ratio on the left key is much larger. So instead of having to peck the key 10 times, the bird now has to peck the key 40 times. So that's quite a bit more effort involved there for each uh, instance of reinforcement. In this situation, it means that you get four times as much reinforcement pecking the right key as you do the left key. So that would tell us that if we were calculating our relative rate of reinforcement for the left key, it would only be 0.2. And if we were calculating it for the right key, it would be the other uh, half of the equation. That would be a 0.8. Um, and again, I'm not going to get you to calculate these out, but that's just sort of an example so that you can see what it should be looking like. Um, so we're saying that based on how much reinforcement you get per effort or per time, that's going to affect this uh, relative rate of reinforcement that we can calculate out. All right. Now, why do we care? Well, that brings us to our matching law, and this was talked about by Hernstein back in the 60s. And they theorized that our relative rates of responding, so the behavioral responding that we see from the organism in the Skinner box, should match the relative rates of reinforcement. So for our pigeon in the box, if the left key and the right key are both reinforced equally, then we should see approximately equal responding to both the left and the right key. So our responding should match the rates of reinforcement that exist. And so mathematically, we can see that they just have set the first of those equations equal to the second of those equations. And there's a simpler version that we can, uh, we'll see a couple of times later on in the chapter. Um, these, they don't show you how they get there mathematically, but they are mathematically equivalent. So if we look at the ratio between the, res the responding on the left to the responding on the right, it should be the same as the ratio between the reinforcement on the left to the reinforcement on the right. Now that makes sense if we have sort of our left and our right, and if we have that FR10 for both again, it makes sense that a pigeon would peck both keys equally. If we then change that to our FR40, and keep this one as FR10, then we would expect that they would peck less to this side and more to this side because the right key is going to get them reinforcement more often. And what this law is saying is that the difference in responding between the left and the right key should be about the same as the rate of reinforcement, that relative rate of reinforcement that we calculated. So where we had calculated a 0.2 as a relative rate of reinforcement and a 0.8 for this side, we should actually see a difference in the physical responding that the organism does to match approximately these numbers. That's what the matching law is stating. So just stated one more way, we can say that the pro the proportion of responding, the choice that is being made, is going to be equal to the proportion of reinforcement for making that choice. Now we can state it even more simply and just say that there is a correlation between the behavior that we observe, the pecking of the different keys, and the environment, which is the reinforcement that you get for pecking either of those keys. So what does this actually look like? 
We have a graph here that shows our relative rate of responding on the left key. So again, we're only focusing on one of the two choices because we can assume the uh, opposite rate of responding to the other. And then we have our relative rate of reinforcement again to that same left key. So that's our uh, BL divided by total responding and our RL divided by total reinforcement um, set the equations um, the same equations we just talked about, but graphed out with actual data. And so here we have two different pigeons who were put in different situations where they have a left key and a right key, and those uh, keys were given differential rein or schedules of reinforcement that matched with a relative rate of reinforcement of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on. Um, and so here we can look at what that data looks like. And so when the left key takes a lot more effort or takes a lot more time, when there's a lot less reinforcement given for um, effort or time or whatever, we see a lot less actual behavioral responding to that left key. In contrast, when we see a lot more reinforcement given for pecking that left key, then we're going to see a lot more behavioral responding for pecking that left key. So that kind of makes sense that the more you're going to get out of doing that behavior, the more reinforcement you get for doing that specific choice of those two options, the more you're going to do it. And this tends to occur across multiple different species. It's just really easy to talk about pigeons because there's lots of pigeon data. Now the matching law seems kind of like it logically makes sense, but of course at this point we must all be thinking, well, it can't always be as simple as that. And that's exactly the case. The matching law works sort of in ideal situations and it's a good general rule of thumb, but it doesn't always apply. Luckily, there is a fairly simple adjustment that can be made to that matching law to make it apply in a lot more situations. So if we take that original equation, the original simplified version of the equation, where it was BL divided by BR equals RL divided by RR, and we add two new terms to it, we can account for most of the violations of matching law. And these two new variables, a B and an S, are introduced and account for bias and sensitivity. So bias would be a preference for one response or one reinforcer over the other. So that's just when maybe the reinforcers that are being delivered, maybe they're not the same. Maybe you're getting food pellets, but one of the food pellets is a different flavor than the other, and maybe you have a preference for one flavor over the other. That would introduce a bias. You might also have a bias to press the left key over the right key just because of the location or something like that. So having this kind of a bias could result in more responding on the preferred side and less uh, responding on the less preferred side. And so in those situations, we would just have a higher value for our B. Our S value for sensitivity is basically looking at the sensitivity of the choice behavior to the relative rates of reinforcement for our different response alternatives. Basically, can the organism tell the difference in reinforcement schedules between the left and the right key? If they can't tell the difference, then they can't really adjust their behavior to match those relative rates of reinforcement. If they can tell the difference, then they would adjust their behavior to match those relative rates of reinforcement. So in a normal situation where they can tell the difference between the two different schedules of reinforcement and there isn't anything strange going on, we would have an S of 1, which basically means that this term inside the brackets is RL divided by R R. Nothing fancy. But if it's difficult for the organism to tell the difference between the two alternatives, then we might see a less than perfect um, ability to tell the difference, and we would see a value of less than one. And so we can actually break this down on the next side. So our perfect matching, when they can tell the difference, nothing weird's going on, S is one. We can also encounter what's called undermatching, which is what I was just describing, where they can't quite tell the difference. They aren't sensitive 
to the difference between what the reinforcement schedule is on the left versus the right. And so we would see under matching. We can also in strange cases have over matching where maybe one of the options is more salient than the other or something like that. This would be seen in a case where S is larger than one. So let's take a moment here before we move on and talk a little bit more about what might lead to overmatching or undermatching. So we've already covered the fact that undermatching can occur if there's reduced sensitivity to rates of reinforcement, if it's very difficult to tell the difference between the rate of reinforcement on the left versus the right, we'd see undermatching. Um, sometimes at the beginning, you'll see sort of try everything behavior where they're not sure yet of what those different rates of reinforcement are. So they're going to push both buttons fairly consistently. So you don't necessarily see good matching behavior yet. This sometimes happens if it's very easy to switch between pressing one key and pressing the other. Basically, if there's no cost to changing what you're doing. Um, and so this is going to take a little bit of a detour here because sometimes when you're looking at these rates of reinforcement and schedules of reinforcement with two different options, experiments will be set up such that the organism has to continue on pressing a certain button or key or whatever until they receive reinforcement. If they have a fixed ratio of 10 on the left, if they stop before they've reached that 10th press, if they stop at, say, 5, they might lose their progress by switching to the other side. So that would be a cost for switching, and it would encourage that animal to continue pressing the key that they're already on until they get reinforcement. So there can be situations where the experiments are set up to incur a cost if you switch partway through a, a cycle of reinforcement. And similar to that, you might also see what's called a changeover delay, where there's a delay in switching from one option to the other, where you can't immediately start earning reinforcement on the other side. So all of these situations would contribute to undermatching, where our S value would be lower than 1. In contrast, we can see overmatching if they have increased sensitivity to one of the rates of reinforcement. So if one of them is more salient or if one of them um, just sort of draws attention more. So we could see this in cases where they are sticking to the best option. So if we have a fixed ratio of 10 on the left and 40 on the right, then maybe that animal chooses to only press the left key because that's the only play or that's the best option. They could press the other key and get reinforcement every once in a while, but it's a lot more effort. So it might be better to stick with the better option. Um, this is also common with high cost of switching. So if you lose all of your progress, if you're partway through a cycle, or if there's a really long delay to switch from one to the other, then you'll see a lot of sticking to one behavior and not switching between the two. And so what does this look like on our graph here? Our undermatching would be a sort of a reduced, more flattened rate of responding, where the relative rate of responding is less important and we get kind of a flatter line, whereas overmatching would be a steeper line, where there's more of a strong preference for one side versus the other, and it changes sort of almost um, irrelevant to what our relative rate of reinforcement is. So our overmatching would be a steeper line and our undermatching is a more flat line compared to the sort of one to one ratio that we expect from just true matching. OK, so that's a decent description of what matching is and what alternatives we can see with overmatching and undermatching. But this whole matching law describes what's going on, but doesn't actually tell us why it's happening. It just sort of describes what we're observing, but it doesn't go into the details. It doesn't explain the mechanisms that are involved. So what we're going to do next is look at maximizing theories and melioration theories to try and see what's going on behind the scenes. Now, our textbook does take a moment to talk about the difference between molar theories and molecular theories. 
molar theories being ones that sort of take a step back and look at everything as a whole, kind of like our matching law has done, where it looks at all of the responses averaged across a whole session. In contrast, our molecular theories are smaller and are going to look more at the range of individual responses. So sometimes you're going to see theories that look at the big picture, they're going to take the average across the entire session, and some of the theories are going to look at a more close-up version, and they're going to look at what's going on for each individual trial or response that's made. So we might see a little bit of both as we go through and talk about other theories coming up. So our maximizing theories are actually fairly cognitively intuitive. And this is the idea that organisms should distribute their behavior so as to ob obtain the maximum amount of reinforcement over time. You want to do whatever is going to get you the most reinforcement in that period of time. And so with this idea, we would say that the animals should switch back and forth between the responses so that they can get as many reinforcers as they possibly can. And there are, as I just mentioned, macro and or sorry, molar and molecular versions of maximizing theories are molar versions, those big picture ones, look at trying to get the most reinforcement across the whole session, and our molecular ones, our narrowed focused versions of these theories, will focus on trying to uh, choose the option that is most likely to get you reinforcement on this particular trial. The cool part is that whether you're looking at the big picture or the small picture, we tend to see fairly similar responses. Now our maximizing theories do a really good job explaining choices between two different ratio schedules. So if you have to choose between an FR10 and an FR20, we tend to actually observe that organisms will stick to the FR10. If you only have to press the button 10 times to get reinforcement, why would you ever press the button that requires 20 inputs to get reinforcement? And we see that with pigeons and with a lot of other animals where they'll stick to just pressing that FR10 button because that is the most likely way to get reinforcement. That's where you're going to get the most reinforcement. So we would see most responding to that specific key. However, our maximizing theories don't always work the way that we would predict. And we can see this especially strongly in our VR to VI schedules. So as a refresher, this would be a case where our uh, left key has a variable ratio response where you have to press the button a certain number of times to get reinforcement. But because it's variable, we don't know how many button presses it takes. So we should see a fairly constant level of responding to that button. For our right button, we would have a VI schedule, so this is a variable interval schedule. So after a certain amount of time has passed, and it is a variable amount of time, so we can't know specifically when it's going to happen, um, if we push the button after that amount of time has passed, we should get reinforcement. And if we just use our maximizing theories, what we would expect to see is that our participants would spend most of their time pressing the button for the VR schedule. They press the button all the time, occasionally stopping to press the VI button because that, after a certain amount of time had passed, should be more likely to give them some kind of reinforcement. But we should see most of their responding to that VR schedule because with the variable response, the more you push it, the more likely you are to get reinforcement. And we do see kind of that pattern. We do see more responding to VR schedules than VI schedules when you have to choose, but both college students and pigeons do this at a rate far less than what would be predicted by maximizing theories. So, they're going in the right direction, but it doesn't completely explain everything. There might be something else going on. Now, on to our second option, which are amelioration theories. Amelioration just refers to the idea of making the situation better than the recent past. Now, our amelioration theory is going to operate somewhere kind of in between the scale of individual trials and looking at the full session. 
with our amelioration theory, we care about our local rate. And a local rate is kind of like a subset of our overall rate of reinforcement across the entire session. And it's only looking at how much reinforcement is awarded per unit time that that organism is devoting to our particular option of interest. So if we have our left and our right keys and we want to calculate our local rate of reinforcement for the left key, we would look at how much reinforcement is given from the left key responding um, divided by the amount of time that the animal pays attention to or devotes to that left key. For those who are visual or number people, we can look at sort of our left versus right keys again. We're only caring about the left side here and say that uh, we get 15 reinforcers over the course of an entire uh, session, which would be, say, a 60 minute session. So 60 minutes, we get 15 reinforcers overall. So if we had calculated out a reinforcement rate for that, we would do 15 divided by 60, which is 0.25. And that's our rate of reinforcement across the entire session. If we want to look at our local rate of reinforcement, we would then have to figure out how much of that total time period um, out of that 60 minute session, was the animal actually paying attention to this left key? For easy math, let's say that the animal only spent 15 minutes out of that 60 minute period paying attention to the left key. The rest of the time they were pecking at the right key or something else. So in that 15 minutes of attention, they got 15 reinforcers because that's still the amount of reinforcement they got specifically from this key. So instead, our local rate of reinforcement is actually one. So our local rate of reinforcement is always going to be higher than our overall rate of reinforcement. And we're just taking into account how much time they're devoting to that particular key. So now that we understand what a local rate of reinforcement is, we can talk about this melioration as trying to switch between alternatives in order to improve your local rate of reinforcement, to try and maximize that local rate of reinforcement, to try and get as much reinforcement um, in that specialized rate of re, uh, reinforcement for either one side or the other. And the overall goal here, or at least the goal according to this theory, is that animals should respond so that the local rates of reinforcement will be the same for either alternative. So if we had a local rate of reinforcement of one on the left side, they should adjust their responding so that they'd have an equivalent rate of responding on the other side. Now, if we worked through it and actually like calculated out having an equal local rate of reinforcement for both the left and the right, we would actually find that our results put us back in line with matching theory, where our rate of responding should match the rate of reinforcement. So it kind of brings us all around back in full circle to our matching law um, and says that melioration might actually be a mechanism that helps explain why the matching law is occurring. The one issue that we have here is that we have a problem where behavior tends to be more strongly controlled by immediate consequences meaning that we value things that happen more um, soon or more quickly than we would things that take a little bit of time. And we'll come back to that and talk about sort of um, devaluation of reinforcement over time. Um, but yeah, that'll be a later on topic. Now that we've covered the basics of choice, we're actually going to move into some more complex variants upon that. And the first of our variants is called the concurrent chain schedule. Now this method is sort of an extension of what we've talked about previously with choice, and it's a method that was specifically designed to determine which of the two options is preferred. Now these types of setups are different from normal choice procedures that we just finished talking about because 
the animal is not free to switch between the different options. So once they've started pecking one key, they cannot switch to the other key freely like they could in previous options. So if we're using a concurrent chain schedule, then we're trying to investigate choice that has a commitment component where once they've made a decision, they have to stick with the decision that's been made. So let's look at a visual to explain what this all means. So in this experiment, there are two different steps. Step one is setting up this choice link. And so they have the option they can press key A or key B. And at this stage, no matter which side they select, they don't get any kind of reinforcer. So if they select A, then they're brought to a terminal link where they have to continue pecking at A in order to receive reinforcement. And in this situation, it's set up so that A is set up with a variable ratio reinforcement schedule of 10. So every 10 pecks plus or minus a little bit is going to get them reinforcement. On the other hand, if they had selected B, in this choice stage, it would bring them into a terminal link where they can only continue pressing B, and B is reinforced with a fixed ratio of 10. So every 10 pecks exactly, they would get reinforcement. And the way that this is set up, if they had chosen A initially, they have to peck that A key until they get reinforcement. If they peck B, they don't get anything. So by making their initial choice, this key is no longer functional, it doesn't do anything for them. And then once they receive their reinforcement, we can loop back and go back to another choice link setup where they can choose between A or B, and then they're forced back into a terminal link where they need to follow through to completion of that session or of that trial where they will get their reinforcement. And this was specifically set up um, to actually test if pigeons or if anybody prefers a variable ratio uh, schedule of reinforcement or a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. Do they prefer knowing that every 10 pecks exactly they get reinforcement or do they prefer having some kind of variety or variability in when they get reinforcement? And the overwhelming response is that pigeons and other species tend to prefer variable intervals over fixed intervals in most situations. And one other cool thing to note about this particular setup is that when we're looking at the choice that's being made at this stage here, our terminal links actually end up becoming conditioned reinforcers because the choice that they make here isn't reinforced by a primary reinforcer right off the bat. It's actually reinforced with the ability to then enter into that next stage, which itself will allow them to earn some kind of primary reinforcer. So the choice at this choice link phase is uh, governed by a conditioned reinforcer, specifically access to one of the terminal link options. And as you can imagine, we can use all sorts of different variants of this with different kinds of schedules of reinforcement on either side to check preference between the two options using this same setup. All right, and so our next topic is going to be looking at temporal self-control, which will lead us into delay discounting. But this is the idea of having to make a choice between choosing to get a smaller reward sooner, um, sometimes just called smaller sooner reward or SS reward, versus getting a larger reward later on, or larger later, LL. So this is a difference between impulsivity, wanting something sooner, even if it's smaller, versus self-control, where we would get a larger reward, but we have to wait for it. This is one of the most well-studied and important versions of complex choice, because we're looking at self-control and the trade-off between these two very different options. So let's see what this looks like for, uh, say, a pigeon in the same kind of concurrent chain procedure that we've looked at previously. So we can have a small reward sooner or a large reward later set up with the same concurrent chain procedure that we just saw, where at that 
choice link stage, they can choose A or B. And then once they've gone in, they can commit to pressing A and getting a small reward very soon. Or they can have chosen B to go into uh, this terminal link where they press B again to get a large reward, but they have to wait much longer for it. And then we can look at their preference between pushing A versus B to see if they'd rather the small reward sooner or the large reward later. We can also look at direct choice procedures where the pigeon can choose the small reward by pressing the left key and the large reward by pressing the right key and then immediately getting either the small or the large, but both can help us look at what their preference is. Now, that's all well and good to see what a pigeon would prefer, but this also exists in humans. So let's look at a scenario. What if I offer you the option of getting $25 right now or $25 in a week. Which of those would you prefer? And obviously, if you're getting $25 either uh, situation, it's more appealing to get it now because why wait a week to get the exact same thing? Okay, but what if we start changing the values? Um, what if there's a difference between $25 now versus $50 in a week? Would you want to wait that long to get twice as much? And what if we take it a step further? What if it's $25 now versus $50 in a year? That seems a lot less appealing, even though it's the same basic idea as 20 now versus 50 in a week, but that's a much longer wait. And so this decrease in appeal that we see the longer we have to wait is delay discounting. So this refers to the idea that the value of a particular reinforcer will decline as a function of how long you have to wait to obtain it. The longer you have to wait to get something, the less reinforcing it is, the less valuable it is as a reinforcer. And so our choices will vary depending on how long of a wait it is because our uh, sort of evaluation of what its value is is going to change based on how long we have to wait. So this idea of delay discounting tells us that when we're looking at two different options, not only do we have to consider the value of whatever that reinforcer is, is it uh, very reinforcing or not very reinforcing, we also have to consider the effect of when that reinforcer comes into play, whether it's immediate or there's some sort of delay. Another real life example of this that pertains to humans would be looking at choosing to continue smoking or choosing to quit smoking. And so we can look at, uh, so quitting smoking, the immediate consequence that is certain is that you go through withdrawal symptoms um, and it, the long-term consequence is going to be that your health improves, probably. If we continue smoking, then the immediate consequence is continuing to receive nicotine, which is seen as a benefit. Um, the long-term consequences is a deterioration in health. Now, each individual could weight the value of uh, sort of how bad is going through withdrawal versus how bad is the long-term health consequences. Um, but we also have to keep in mind that time delay. So something bad happening far off in the future is a lot less influencing on our behavior than something immediate. So the bad in the far future doesn't necessarily outweigh the good in the immediate. In the same way that the bad in the immediate isn't necessarily outweighed by the good in the long-term future here. So we have to consider our short term and long term um, and how that affects the magnitude of our perceived value for a given reinforcer. And an interesting thing to note is that if we change a factor that is more immediate, something like changing the price of cigarettes, um, which has been done in the past, where we saw that a 10% increase in cigarette prices, which is sort of an immediate consequence where you have to pay more money, we actually see a drop in consumption. Um, and so that's because that immediate consequence is maybe a little bit more salient than some of our long-term and uncertain things that have uh, sort of a delay component to them. And I found this to be really interesting, where we can look at 
um, basically how long different species are willing to wait before it starts affecting their choices. So here on the graph, we have mean delay at indifference, which is basically how much of a delay can they tolerate? And we can look at a bunch of different species. We can look at pigeons, rats, tamarins, marmosets, lots and lots of um, uh, ape species over here. And we see that they have a fairly low delay rate um, where they will only tolerate very small delays. Pigeons, uh, that looks like about five seconds before they no longer care. But as we get into chimpanzees and even towards humans, we can tolerate longer and longer differences. Sorry, longer and longer delays before indifference. So different species have different tolerances for delay. And I just thought that would be interesting to note here. And as you may have expected, there is, of course, an equation to go over this idea of delay discounting. So we can look at the value discounting function, which tells us that the value of a particular reinforcer is going to be directly related to the magnitude of that reinforcer. So how much is it that we're getting and inversely related to the delay or how long we have to wait. So uh, the bigger and more appealing something is, the higher we're going to value it, but the longer we have to wait for it, the less we're going to value it. And if we wanted to calculate out a specific value um, of a particular reinforcer, we can actually do that using this equation here. And the important thing to note here is that this has another term K, which isn't mentioned in our definition thing at the top, but this is what's called a discounting parameter. And that's basically how quickly does uh, the reinforcer lose value as we have to wait? So basically, how sensitive are we to that discounting delay? And what we tend to see from this equation, if you worked it out for a given person or for a given scenario, is that we'll see this hyperbolic uh, decay function where as time goes on, as there's a larger and larger delay, the value of that reinforcer will decrease fairly rapidly and will eventually kind of stabilize um, out being very worth very little to us at the end. And again, I'm not going to have you calculate out a value for this, but what I might ask you to do is sort of interpret um, if we increase the magnitude or decrease the delay or whatever, um, what would that do to affect our value? So having an intuitive understanding of what this equation does, as opposed to actually being able to punch numbers into the equation. Right, and then we can start uh, wrapping up here by talking about some of the long-term effects that are related to this idea of self-control or tolerance of delay. And at this point in your psychology careers, you've probably seen the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. This is an experiment where a whole bunch of children were given, uh, actually, let's go to the next slide where I have images. They're given a plate with a single marshmallow on it. And they're told that if you can wait until the experimenter comes back, if you haven't eaten your marshmallow yet, then when we come back, we'll give you another marshmallow. So you can either have one marshmallow now, or you can wait and get a second marshmallow. And I've linked uh, one of the videos covering this experiment um, on eClass, so you can hop over and watch that if you want. You get to see all sorts of anguished faces as children try and get themselves to wait in order to get two marshmallows at the end. And so this is a perfect example of delayed gratification, where if you can wait long enough, you're going to get twice as much at the end. So you're going to get a much larger reinforcer if you can wait. And of course, there are tons of different variations on this experiment. They could have, uh, they give you a less preferred food and say that if you don't eat this, when I come back, I'll give you something that you like better. And again, we see kind of the same pattern where 
that self-control is very difficult for a lot of the children. And in fact, only one third of those studied ended up waiting long enough to get the second marshmallow or to get their more preferred option of food. And that ability to wait seemed to correlate with age, where older children tended to have a lot more self-control than younger children did. And for our long-term effects of this, they found that if they followed students or children who had so-called failed the marshmallow task, where they had eaten the first marshmallow, they tended also to have lower SAT scores, less educational and professional achievement, and higher rates of drug use in the long term than children who had passed the marshmallow task and who had shown that self-control early on. Of course, the idea of self-control is a very complex one and it can interrelate with a whole bunch of other factors and things like that. Um, but for some of our clinical implications of this effect of lowered self-control, we can actually see a correlation with lowered self-control in individuals who develop substance abuse disorders, who have uh, impulsive overeating and other uh, impulse control types of disorders and pathological gambling. All of those are related to having low levels of self-control or more impulsive behavior. And there's this complex interaction with ADHD and specifically the hyperactive impulsive type of ADHD, which can be related to all of these as well, just because that type of ADHD tends to be related with impulsivity. So there's a lot of factors going on here. Just something to keep in mind as we wrap up the chapter, and then we'll move on to chapter seven in our next video.